Leon Darmely, 20 years of age. Profession, artist. Hair black, eyes black, traveling with his sister. Capital, how did you get this pass? Dumont Christou for letters to the directors of the theaters at Rome and Naples. I expressed my fears of traveling as a woman. He perfectly understood them and undertook to... Instead of that, Louise, do you understand? Air, liberty, melody of birds, plains of Lombardy, Venetian canals, Roman palaces, the bay. How much have we, Louise? The young girl to whom this question was addressed drew from an inlaid secretaire a small portfolio with a lock, in which she counted twenty-three banknotes. Twenty-three thousand francs, said she. And as much at least in pearls, diamonds and jewels, said Eugenie. We are rich. With forty-five thousand francs we can live like princesses for two years, and comfortably for four. But before six months you with your music and I with my voice we shall come. You shall take charge of the money, I of the jewel box, so that if one of us had the misfortune to lose her treasure, the other would still have hers left. Now, the portmanteau, let us make haste. The portmanteau stop, said Louise, going to Liston at Madame Dangler's door. What do you fear? That we may be discovered. The door is locked. They may tell us to open it. They may if they like, but we will not. There now, said Eugenie, while I change my costume, do you lock the portmanteau? Louise pressed with all the strength of her little hands on the top of the portmanteau. But I cannot, said she. I am not strong enough. Do you shut it? Ah, you do well to ask, said Eugenie, laughing. I forgot that I was Hercules, and you... When this was done, Eugenie opened a drawer, of which she kept the key, and took from it a wadded violet silk traveling cloak. Here, said she, you see, said she thought of everything. With this cloak you will not be cold, but you will. I am never cold, you know, besides, with these, besides, what is there astonishing? When you think of the grief I ought to be in, that I shut myself up. Tell me, no. Truly you comfort me, come and help me. From the Then, with a promptitude which indicated that this was not the first time she had amused herself by adopting the garb of the opposite sex, Eugenie drew on the boots and pantaloons. Oh, that is very good, indeed. It is very good, said Louise, looking at her with admiration. But that beautiful black hair, those magnificent braids, and with her left hand seizing the thick mass, which her long fingers could scarcely grasp, she took in her right hand a pair of long scissors, and soon the steel met through the rich and sp Then she grasped the front hair, which she also cut off without expressing the least regret. On the contrary, her eyes sparkled with greater pleasure than usual under her ebony eyebrows. Fifty thousand thirty-nine M. O. the magnificent hair, said Louise, with regret. And am I not a hundred times better thus? cried Eugenie, smoothing the scattered curls of her hair, which had now quite a masculine appearance. And do you not think me... Now, where are you going? To Brussels, if you like. It is the nearest frontier. We can go to Brussels. Liege, Aix-la-Chapelle. Then up the Rhine to Strasbourg. We will cross Switzerland, and go down into Italy by the St. Gothard. Will that do? Yes. What are you looking at? I am looking at you. Indeed, you are adorable like that. One would say you were carrying me off. And they would be right. Pardieu. Then, having blown out the lights, the two fugitives, looking and listening eagerly, with outstretched necks, opened the door of a dressing room which led by a side staircase. To the yard was empty. The clock was striking twelve. The porter was not yet gone to bed. Eugenie approached softly, and saw the old man sleeping soundly in an armchair in his lodge. She returned to Louise, took up the portmanteau, which she had placed for a moment on the ground, and they reached the archway under the shadow of the wall. Eugenie concealed Louise in an angle of the gateway, 
so that if the porter chanced to awake he might see but one person. Then, placing herself in the full light of the lamp which lit the yard, gate, cried she, with her finest contralto voice, and rapping at the window. The porter got up as Eugenie expected, and even advanced some steps to recognize the person who was going out, but seeing a young man striking his boot impatiently with his riding whip, he Louise slid through the half-open gate like a snake, and bounded lightly forward. Eugenie, apparently calm, although in all probability her heart beat somewhat faster than usual, went out in her turn. A porter was passing, and they gave him the portmanteau. Then the two young girls, having told him to take it to know, 36, Rue de la Victoire, walked behind this man, whose presence comforted Louise. As for Eugenie, she was as strong as a Judith or a Delala. They arrived at the appointed spot. Eugenie ordered the porter to put down the portmanteau, gave him some pieces of money, and having rapped at the shutter, sent him away. The shutter where Eugenie had rapped was that of a little laundress, who had been previously warned, and was not yet gone to bed. She opened the door. Mademoiselle, said Eugenie, let the porter get the post-chaise from the coach-house, and fetch some post-horses from the hotel. Here are five francs for his trouble. Indeed, said Louise, I admire you, and I could almost say respect you. The laundress looked on in astonishment, but in a quarter of an hour the porter returned with a post-boy and horses, which were harnessed, and put in the post-chaise in a minute, while the porter fastened the portmanteau on with the assistance of a cord and Here is the passport, said the postillion. Which way are we going, young gentleman? To Fontainebleau, replied Eugenie with an almost masculine voice. What do you say? said Louise. I am giving them the slip, said Eugenie. This woman to whom we have given twenty Louis may betray us for forty. We will soon alter our direction. And the young girl jumped into the You are always right, said the music teacher, seating herself by the side of her friend. A quarter of an hour afterwards the postillion, having been put in the right road, passed with a crack of his whip through the gateway of the barrier St. Martin. A said Louise, breathing freely. Here we are out of Paris. Yes, my dear, the abduction is an accomplished fact, replied Eugenie. Yes, and without violence, said Louise. I shall bring that forward as an extenuating circumstance, replied Eugenie. These words were lost in the noise which the carriage made in rolling over the pavement of La Villette. Hmm. Danglers no longer had a daughter. Chapter 98 The Bell and Bottle Tavern, and now let us leave Mademoiselle Danglers and her friend pursuing their way to Brussels, and return to poor Andre Cavalcante, so inopportunely interrupted in his rock, notwithstanding his youth. Master Andre was a very skilful and intelligent boy. We have seen that on the first rumor which reached the salon he had gradually approached the door, and crossing two or three rooms at last disappeared but we have forgotten to mention one circumstance, which nevertheless ought not to be omitted. In one of the rooms he crossed, the trousseau of the bride-elect was on exhibition. There were caskets of diamonds, cashmere shawls, Valentin's lace English veils, and in fact all the tempting things, the bare mention of which makes the hearts of young girls bound. Furnished with this plunder, Andre leaped with a lighter heart from the window, intending to slip through the hands of the gendarmes, tall and well-proportioned as an ancient gladiator, and muscular as a Spartan. He walked for a quarter of an hour without knowing where to direct his steps, actuated by the sole idea, having passed through the Rue du Mont Blanc, guided by the instinct which leads thieves always to take the safest path, he found himself at the end of the Rue Lafayette. There he stopped, breathless and panting. He was quite alone. On one side was the vast wilderness of the Saint Lazare, on the other, Paris enshrouded in darkness. Am I to be captured? He cried. No, not if I can use more activity than my enemies. My safety is now a mere question of speed. 
At this moment he saw a cab at the top of the Faubourg Poissonier. The dull driver, smoking his pipe, was plodding along toward the limits of the Faubourg St. Denis, where no doubt he ordinarily had his station. Ho! Oh. Friend, said Benedetta. What do you want, sir? asked the driver. Is your horse tired? Tired? Oh, yes, tired enough he has done nothing the whole of this blessed day. Four wretched fares, and twenty. Tell me what I am to do for this. A very easy thing, if your horse isn't tired. I tell you he'll go like the wind. Only tell me which way to drive towards the... He should have waited for me here with a cabriolet till half-past eleven. It is twelve, and tired of waiting. He must have gone on, it is likely. Well, will you try... That's all right, said the man. Hop in, and we rue off, fool. Andre got into the cab, which passed rapidly through the fall. They never overtook the chimerical friend, yet Andre frequently inquired of people on foot whom he passed and at the inns which were not yet closed, for a green cabriolet and bay horse. Every one had just seen it pass. It was only five hundred, two hundred, one hundred steps in advance. At length they reached it, but it was not the friend. Once the cab was also passed by a calash rapidly whirled along by two post horses. I said Cavalcanta to himself, if I only had that Britska, those two good post horses, and above all the passport that carries them on, and he sighed deeply. The calash contained Mademoiselle Danglers and Mademoiselle de Larmely. Hurry, hurry, said Andrea, we must overtake him soon and the poor horse resumed the desperate gallop it had kept up since leaving the barrier, and arrived steaming at lovers. Certainly, said Andrea, I shall not overtake my friend, but I shall kill your horse, therefore I had better stop. Here are thirty francs. I will sleep at the Cheval Rouge, and will secure a place in the first coach. Good night, friend. And Andre, after placing six pieces of five francs each in the man's hand, leaped lightly on to the pathway. The cabman joyfully pocketed the sum and turned back on his road to Paris. Andrea pretended to go towards the hotel of the Cheval Rouge, but after leaning an instant against the door and hearing the last sound of the cab, which was disappearing from view, then he rested. He must be near Chapel and Serval where he pretended to be going. It was not fatigue that stayed Andre here. It was that he might form some resolution, adopt some plan. It would be impossible to make use of a diligence, equally so to engage post-horses. To travel either way a passport was necessary. It was still more impossible to remain in the department of the Oines, one of the most open and strictly guarded in France. This was quite out of the question especially to a man like Andrea, he sat down by the side of the moat, buried his face in his hands and reflected. Ten minutes after he raised his head, his resolution was made. He threw some dust over the top boat, which he had found time to unhook from the antechamber and button over his ball costume, and going to chapel and serval, he knocked loudly at the door. The host opened. My friend, said Andrea, I was coming from Mortefontaine to Senlis, when my horse, which is a troublesome creature, stumbled and threw me. I must reach Compiègne tonight, or I shall cause deep anxiety to my family. Could you let me hire a horse of you? An innkeeper has always a horse to let, whether it be good or bad. The host called the stable boy, and ordered him to saddle the blank. Then he awoke his son, a child of seven years whom he ordered to ride before the gentleman and bring back the horse. Andre gave the innkeeper twenty francs, and in taking them from his pocket dropped a visiting card. This belonged to one of his friends at the Cafe de Paris, so that the innkeeper, picking it up after Andre had left, was convinced that he had led his horse to the Count of Mollion. Leblanc was not a fast animal, but he kept up an easy, steady pace. In three hours and a half Andre had traversed the nine leagues which separated him from Compiègne, 
there is an excellent tavern at Compiègne, well remembered by those who have ever been there. Andre, who had often stayed there in his rides about Paris, recollected the bell and bottle inn. He turned around, saw the sign by the light of a reflected lamp, and having dismissed, a waiter opened the door. My friend, said Andrea, I have been dining at St. Jean all boys, and expected to catch the coach which passes by at midnight, but like a fool I have lost my way. Show me into one of those pretty little rooms which overlook the court, and bring me a cold fowl and a bottle of Bordeaux. The waiter had no suspicions. Andre spoke with perfect. While the waiter was preparing his room, the hostess arose. Andre assumed his most charming smile, and asked if he could have no. Three, which he had occupied on his last stay at Compiègne. Unfortunately, no. Three was engaged by a young man who was traveling with his sister. Andre appeared in despair, but consoled himself when the hostess assured him that no. Seven, prepared for him, was situated precisely the same as no. Three, and while warming his feet and chatting about the last races at Chantilly, he waited until they announced his room to be ready. Andre had not spoken without cause of the pretty rooms looking out upon the court of the Bell Hotel, which with its triple galleries like those of a theatre, with the jessamine and clematis twining round the light, the fell was tender, the wine old, the fire clear and sparkling, and Andrea was surprised to find himself eating with as good an appetite as though nothing had happened. Then he went to bed and almost immediately fell into that deep sleep which is sure to visit men of twenty years of age, even when they are torn with remorse. Now, here we are obliged to own that Andrea ought to have felt remorse, but that he did not. This was the plan which had appealed to him to afford the best chance of his security. Before daybreak he would awake, leave the inn after rigorously paying his bill, and reaching the forest. He would, under pretense of making studies in painting, test once past the frontier, Andre proposed making money of his diamonds, and by uniting the proceeds to ten banknotes he always carried about with him in case of accident, he would then Moreover, he reckoned much on the interest of the danglers to hush up the rumor of their own misadventures. These were the reasons which, added to the fatigue, caused Andre to sleep so soundly. In order that he might wake early he did not close the shutters, but contented himself with bolting the door and placing on the table an unclasped and long-pointed knife, whose temper he well knew. About seven in the morning Andrea was awakened by a ray of sunlight, which played warm and brilliant upon his face. In all well-organized brains, the predominating idea, and there always is one, is sure to be the last thought before sleeping, and the first upon waking in the morning. Andre had scarcely opened his eyes when his predominating idea presented itself and whispered in his ear that he had slept too long. He jumped out of bed and ran to the window. A gendarme was crossing the court. A gendarme is one of the most striking objects in the world, even to a man void of uneasiness. But for one who has a timid conscience, and with good cause too, the yellow blue, why is that gendarme there? asked Andrea of himself. Then, all at once, he replied, with that logic which the reader has doubtless remarked in him, there is nothing astonishing in seeing a gendarme at an inn. In now then, said Andrea while dressing himself, I'll wait till he leaves, and then I'll slip away. 50,047 and saying this, Andrea, not only was the first gendarme still there, but the young man now perceived a second yellow, blue, and white uniform at the foot of the staircase, the only one by which he could dis The appearance of the third gendarme settled the matter, for a crowd of curious loungers was extended before him, effectually blocking the entrance to the hotel. They were after me, was Andre's first thought. Diable, a pallor overspread the young man's forehead, and he looked around him with anxiety. His room, like all those on the same floor, had but one outlet to the gallery in the sight of everybody. I am lost, was his second thought. And, indeed, 
for a man in Andre's situation. An arrest meant the assizes, trial and death, death without murder. For a moment he convulsively pressed his head within his hands, and during that brief period he became nearly mad with terror. But soon a ray of hope glimmered in the multitude of thoughts which bewildered he looked around and saw the objects of his search upon the chimney-piece. They were a pen, ink, and paper. With forced composure he dipped the pen in the ink and wrote the following lines upon a sheet of paper. I have no money to pay my bill, but I am not a dishonest man. I'll, I shall be excused for leaving at daybreak, for I was ashamed. He then drew the pen from his cravat and placed it on the paper. This done... Instead of leaving the door fastened, he drew back the bolts and even placed the door ajar, as though he had left the room forgetting to close it, and slipping in. At this precise time, the first gendarmandry had noticed walked upstairs, preceded by the commissary of police, and supported by the second gendarme who guarded the staircase. Andrea was indebted for this visit to the following circumstances. At daybreak, the telegraphs were set at work in all directions, and almost immediately the authorities in every district had exerted their utmost endeavors to arrest the murderer of Catteret. Compiègne, that royal residence and fortified town, is well furnished with authorities, gendarmes, and commissaries of police. They therefore began operations as soon as the telegraph. Now, besides the reports of the sentinels guarding the Hotel de Ville, which is next door to the Bell and Bottle. It had been stated by others that a number of travellers had arrived during the night. The sentinel, who was relieved at six o'clock in the morning, remembered perfectly that, just as he was taking his post a few minutes past four, a young man arrived on horseback, with a little... The young man, having dismissed the boy and horse, knocked at the door of the hotel, which was opened, and again closed after his entrance. This late arrival had attracted much suspicion, and the young man being no other than Andrea, the commissary and gendarme, who was a brigadier, directed their steps towards his room. They found the door ajar. Oh, oh, said the brigadier, who thoroughly understood the trick. A bad sign to find the door open. I would rather find it triply bolted. And, indeed, the Andrea had fled. We say corroborated because the brigadier was too experienced to be convinced by a single proof. He glanced around, looked in the bed, shook the curtains, opened the closets, and finally stopped at the chimney. Andre had taken the precaution to leave no traces of his feet in the ashes, but still it was an outlet, and in this light was not to be passed over without serious investigation. The brigadier sent for some sticks and straw, and having filled the chimney with them, set a light to it. The fire crackled, and the smoke ascended like the dull vapor from a volcano, but still no prisoner fell down, as they expected. The fact was that Andrea, at war with society ever since his youth, was quite as deep as a gendarme, even though he were advanced to the rank of brigadier, and quite fifty thousand forty-nine him at one time he thought he was saved, for he heard the brigadier exclaim in a loud voice to the two gendarmes, he is not here, but venturing to peep. It was now his turn to look about him. The Hotel de Ville, a massive 16th century building, was on his right. Anyone could descend from the openings in the tower. If once discovered, he knew he would be lost, for the roof afforded no chance of escape. He therefore resolved to descend, not through the same chimney by which he had. He looked around for a chimney from which no smoke issued, and having reached it, he disappeared through the orifice without being seen by anyone. At the same minute, one of the little windows of the Hotel de Ville was thrown open, and the head of a gendarme appeared. For an instant it remained motionless as one of the stone decorations of the building. Then after a long sigh of disappointment the head disappeared. The brigadier, calm and dignified as the law he represented, passed through the crowd, without answering the thousand questions addressed to him, and re-entered the hotel. Well, asked the two gendarmes. Well, my boys, said the brigadier, the brigand must really have escaped early this morning, 
but we will send to the villers Cotterets and Noyan roads, and search the forest. Ah, what is that? cried the brigadier. Some traveller seems impatient, said the host. What number was it that rang? Number three, run, waiter. At this moment the screams and ringing were redoubled. Aha, said the brigadier, stopping the servant. The person who is ringing appears to want something more than a waiter. We will attend upon him with a gendarme, who occupies number three. The little fellow who arrived last night in a post-chaise with his sister, and who asked for an apartment with two beds. The bell here rang for the third time. Follow me, Mr. Commissary, said the brigadier. Tread in my steps. Wait an instant, said the host. Number three has two staircases, inside and outside. I will take charge of the inside one. Are the carbons loaded? Yes. Brigadier. Well, you guard the exterior, and if he attempts to fly, fire upon him. He must be a great criminal. This is what had happened. Andrea had very cleverly managed to descend to thirds of the chimney, but then his foot slipped, and notwithstanding his endeavors, he came into the room with... It would have signified little had the room been empty, but unfortunately it was occupied. Two ladies, sleeping in one bed, were awakened by the noise, and fixing their eyes upon the spot whence the sound proceeded, they saw a man. One of these ladies, the fair one, uttered those terrible shrieks which resounded through the house, while the other, rushing to the bell rope, rang with all her strength. Andrea, as we can see, was surrounded by misfortune. For pity's sake, he cried, pale and bewildered, without seeing whom he was addressing. For pity's sake, do not call assistance. Save me. I will not harm you. Eugenie, Mademoiselle Danglers, exclaimed Andrea, stupefied. Help! Help! cried Mademoiselle de Normally, taking the bell from her companion's hand and ringing it yet more violently. Save me! I am pursued, said Andrea, clasping his hands. For pity, for mercy's sake, do not deliver me up. It is too late. They are coming, said Eugenie. Well, conceal me somewhere. You can say you were needlessly alarmed. You can turn their suspicions and save my life. Fifty thousand fifty-three and the two ladies, pressing close. Well, be it so. At length, said Eugenie, return by the same road you came, and we will say nothing about you, unhappy wretch. Here he is, here he is. A violent blow from the butt end of the musket burst open the lock. Two more forced out the bolts, and the broken door fell in. Andrea ran to the other door, leading to the gallery, ready to rush out. But he was stopped short, and he stood with his body a little thrown back, pale, and with the youth, fly. Then, cried Mademoiselle Darmely, whose pity returned as her fears diminished, fly or kill yourself, said Eugenie, in a tone which a vest. Andre shuddered, and looked on the young girl with an expression which proved how little he understood such ferocious honor. Kill myself. He cried, throwing down his knife. Why should I do so? Why, you said, answered Mademoiselle Danglers, that you would be condemned to die. Come, come, said Andrea. Sheathe your sword, my fine fellow. There is no occasion to make such a fuss, since I give myself up. And he held out his The two girls looked with horror upon this shameful metamorphosis the man of the world shaking off his covering and appearing as a galley slave. Andre turned towards them, and with an impertinent smile asked, Have you any message for your father, Mademoiselle Danglers? For in all probability I shall return to Paris. Oh, oh, said Andre, you need not be ashamed, even though you did post after me. Was I not nearly your husband? Fifty thousand fifty-six men with this raillery, Andre went out, leaving the two girls a prey to their own feelings of shame, and to the comments of the cr An hour after they stepped into their calash, both dressed in feminine attire. The gate of the hotel had been closed to screen them from sight, but they were forced, when the door was open, to pass through a throng of curious glances and whispering voices. Eugenie closed her eyes, 
but though she could not see, she could hear, and the sneers of the crowd reached her in the carriage. Oh, why is not the world a wilderness? she exclaimed, throwing herself into the arms of Mademoiselle de Marmalee, her eyes sparkling with the same kind of rage which made Nero wish that the Rome. The next day they stopped at the Hotel de Flander at Brussels. The same evening Andrea was incarcerated in the conciergerie.